this video is being recorded the last few days before this uh, step system being turned down here at my home. All of the equipment in the building and other buildings being relocated to the Denver metro area. The purpose of this video is to detail what I had done so that it can be used as reference in the future. I'm on a ladder uh, towards the top of the bay, so if there's any movement, I apologize about that. What I have here in this particular area is a common fuse panels that provide the 48 volt power to the trunks and auxiliary equipment that needs anywhere from a 5 amp or lower fuse. The bell system generally fused almost everything at amp and a third, which is a white fuse. And this, these panels here are 70 type fuses, and there's various types of fuses that were made <clears throat> in the telephone industry. In 2025, they're typically using what is called a GMT fuse, which is a much smaller fuse. However, they operate the same way. They're alarm indicating fuses, just much smaller and uh, more readily available. This here equipment goes back to the uh, 1960s and later. This is new enough, it's wire wrap. Also, in step-by-step -step machines and some of the early crossbar machines, what was referred to as a, a return panel, uh, bus maybe is the correct term, <clears throat> the early days, the return was directly attached to the steel plates and it was nothing but a ground. In the telephone industry, uh, not in the 2025s necessarily, it was referred to as battery and ground. So you could have a 48 volt or a 24 volt or any of the other voltages as well, which is a multitude of them depending on the type of an office and what the equipment was doing. So you would have a positive ground uh, system generally. The color code in this case, this is all PVC wire and PVC wire begin in the, um, I'm going to say very late 50s, early 60s. They were using cotton covered wire up to that point. So most everything I have is PVC wiring because it's the best to work with and it's the newest type. These particular panels right here is wired with 22 gauge wire. Generally when they wired the equipment in a central office such as trunks and um, items that required less than a 5 amp fuse, they generally used 22 gauge wire. If you were less than 5 amps, let's say 3 amps or down, you could use 24 gauge wire. The reason for the heavier gauge wire is they don't want loss because the wire is just a great big resistor. It's a low loss resistor, but it is still a resistor. And the original concept that I was told was they wanted less than a quarter of a volt drop when the commercial power dropped off and you were running on batteries. That's when it was very critical. If your rectifiers are on, 
um, of the AC power, then they're floating the batteries around 52 to 53 volts. And at that point, the drop would be nominal. And even a quarter of a volt, the drop is nominal. It's depending on the distance between the fuse and the trunk. In my particular machine here, which is set up uh, the exact way that Western Electric did offices, except uh, if you were in a big office, and some of the offices I worked in, they had a relay rack that was 11 and a half foot tall, full of these panels, and they may have one or two or three, depending on how many hundred trunks was in the office or auxiliary equipment. So if you follow the 25 pair color code, of course, the 25 pair color code is still being used today, but generally the CAT 5 and 6 cable uses the first four pair of the 25 pair color code, uh, which would be the white and the blue, white orange, white green, white brown. And then, of course, the fifth pair would be white slate if you had a larger cable. If you look at the schematics and how they laid out the power distribution, the tip of the cable pair, you have two leads, the tip and a ring. So the tip would be the whites in this case, or the reds, the blacks, yellows, or violets. The ring colors would be uh, the blue, the orange, green, the brown, and the slate. So to make a 25 pair cable, and I won't read off every pair, but white, blue, white, orange, white, green, and it ends with the violet slate pair. You use the tip side of the cable, the pair, as your ground. And again, the telephone industry, <clears throat> for the most part, uses positive ground. Uh, and when I say that, if you look at what is being made with the ATAs, which are floating power supplies, and a lot of today's technology, um, you hope they're using positive ground, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are. And the reason that I was told and I've read about positive ground was electrolysis. Uh, if you use the positive source instead of the negative source, it ate up the cable plant and caused all kinds of corrosive issues and so forth. I'm not an outside plant engineer. I only know of this from working 45 years in the telephone industry. If you follow the key system equipment or a central office in PBX, you'll find that generally, probably 90% of the time, if you see a, a tip color wire and you're dealing with power, specifically power, the tip will be the positive ground and the ring side will be your fused load. It, I cover in my collection of videos central office, key systems, single line phone, and transport. So I have a wide exposure to different types of uh, technology. And across all of those, they do follow that fairly close. There will be an exception. If you have a four pair wire that you're running somewhere and you need, shall we say, five grounds and three sources, nobody's going to take and run a second cable for one single conductor. So at that point, you can use a ring color for ground. It throws off the system, but you know, it's an electrical, the electricity in the grounds don't care. I typically, in all of my work, regardless of what it is, 95% of the time, a tip conductor will always, always be ground. And the ring conductor will always be battery. If you get into switching, uh, 
things, they don't generally, except for ringing, they don't generally switch the negative source. So if you're using relays, one side of each of the relay coils would be connected to a 48 volt fuse without any switches or any break in it. And then the other side of the coil would be looking for a ground from something. So if you're controlling a bunch of stuff, you would put a ground on the uh, that side of the winding to operate the relay. And at that point, it comes down to how many leads you have, what are you trying to do? I, for myself, try to always use the tip side of the line connected to the coil for controlling it so that when I look at the coil, I know that I am switching something and not power. There is some exceptions to that. If you're dealing with telephone switchboards, the cord board type boards, they switch the lamp source off and on. So the lamps are all grounded. The bus is tied together and it's connected to ground. If you're involved in the ringing, whether superimposed ringing or dry ringing, um, then of course at that point that is switched you normally don't wire ringing hot to something. In the case of a central office, it's at the ringing plant. It can be hot to a trunk if you needed continuous ringing uh, for something. And again, that's very specific to whatever the application is at that time. So with this unit, what I've done is to reduce the amount of running thousands and thousands of feet of two conductor wire, which would be typically black and red or red and black. The black would be connected to ground and the red would be connected to your negative source. Um, I ran, in this case, 28 pair. Um, actually, it might be 32 pair as well. Uh, to each of the relay racks. That also does bring up a point. When you're in a central office, you will have odd configuration of cables. You can have uh, six pair, eight pair, 10 pair, 12 pair, 16, 24, 25, uh, 28, 30, 32, um, 64 and 128 pairs, especially in the ESS world, they used 128 pair in the 5E machines, and Nortel used um, 32 pair cables uh, on the DMS 10s, and I think on the 100s they might have used 64 pair, depending on uh, the frame block. Uh, and again, it's depending on the application, so there's no absolute. Um, on every single bit of this. It, it's not. And I don't know what the Stromberg DCOs did. I'm assuming they probably did 16 to 32 pair cables as well. Your multiplexers, your optical multiplexers, where they're taking T1s and making a uh, an OCN, which would be an OC1, OC3, etc., they usually use a minimum of 28 pair because a DS3, which is equivalent to an OC1, the electrical side would be a, a DS3 or T3, you would have 28 circuits on uh, that much, so you would have to have at least 28 transmits and 28 receives going to your DSX1 jacks. <laughs> So here again, I've got most of this is, you know, at least 28 to 30 pair uh, or so. I also have some six pair that ran to some other shelves uh, that was miscellaneous. When you're involved in the key system PBX world, typically everything out of the PBX machines, the old ones, would be 25 pair cables and you would not be finding the odd count size for the most part.
I'm at the other end of this 30 or 32 pair of cable. And as you can see here, this is my power. So the orange will be 48 volts and the yellow will be ground. Up here, the blue will be 48 and the yellow blue will be ground. That is how I wire everything. There's a, such a rare occasion that I may change that uh, but normally I do things uh, standard, and the bell system did the thing standard. Of course, the bell system was not infallible. It all depended on the installer, and I've worked with people who simply flat out didn't care. A color of wire didn't mean anything to them. They hated their job. They just wanted to get it done, and whatever it took to make it work. So you will find discrepancies from time, but if you follow the documentation, generally the tip side will be ground. The end of the first segment, DC power and wiring.